Python is not a functional language. In fact, everything in Python is an object. But you're doing yourself a huge disservice if you don't know at least a few things about functional programming. There are many things we can take from functional programming to make our code easier to maintain and easier to test. So today I'm gonna to cover the three most important takeaways from functional programming, or actually from the paradigm it belongs to, and show you a few examples of how you can apply them to your own code. But if you truly want to write great software, you need to think things through before you start writing code. I've written a guide to help you with this. You can get it at arion.codes slash design guide. It contains the seven steps I take whenever I design a new piece of software. If you make a mistake at the start of the design process, this can be very expensive to fix later on. The guide is gonna help you avoid that. Arion.codes slash design guide. The link is also in the description. There's a fundamental difference between object-oriented programming and functional programming that goes beyond whether you're using classes with methods or functions. In fact, object-oriented programming and functional programming are part of two completely different paradigms, imperative and declarative programming. Imperative programming focuses on how to execute. It defines control flow as statements that change a program's state. A developer that writes code using this paradigm specifies the steps that a computer must take to accomplish the goal. It's also referred to as algorithmic programming sometimes. Most mainstream languages included object-oriented programming languages like C Sharp, Visual Basic, Java, and Python were designed to primarily support imperative programming. Object-oriented programming is a subset of imperative programming that adds classes and objects to the mix. Declarative programming focuses on what to execute. It defines program logic, but not a detailed control flow. An example of declarative programming is SQL statements. We don't care how it's done, that's the control flow, we just specify what we need. Excel is also a good example of declarative programming. You write in a cell what you want the computed value to be, you don't care about how it's done. Functional programming is a specific form of declarative programming. From Wikipedia, in computer science, functional programming is a programming paradigm where programs are constructed by applying and composing functions. Now, before I talk more about functional programming, let's take a look at an example. I have a very simple example here, which is a greeting class. This has an initializer. Inside the initializer, I'm getting the current date and time and checking whether we're in the morning, in the afternoon, or in the evening. And based on that value, I create an instance variable greeting intro that gets either good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Then I have a greet method that takes a name and it uses this greeting intro to greet the person. And then I also have another method to greet a whole list of people at the same time. And then I have main function where I read a name I create a greeting object and then I greet the person. Now, if this is something you really wanted to build, I would normally not use object-oriented programming, but I'm doing this to show you the difference. So when I run this code, I'm getting something very simple. So I'm entering my name and then it's going to greet me. So as you can see, I'm recording this in the morning. There are a few things that are important when you're considering this class. One is that the initializer relies on the date time package it creates a daytime object. And that means that every time you use greeting, the result might be different. Another issue is that the greet method prints things to the screen. And greet list calls the greet method, so indirectly it does that as well. Because the methods in the greeting class directly print things to the screen, they're hard to test. and can't really be used by applications that don't print anything to the console, but use, for example, a GUI. Printing is an example of a side effect. When you call the method, it modifies something outside of the function, the screen in this case. In general, a side effect is when a function or method relies on or modify something on the outside of that function. Printing something is an example, but other examples are reading from and writing to a file or interacting with the database or another service over a network. Side effects make your code harder to maintain and make things harder to test because you can't isolate a function or a method properly. If a function doesn't have side effects and the return value is only determined by its input values, so no random number generation or relying on outside things like the current date and time, then the function is called a pure function. As opposed to functions with side effects, pure functions are easy to test and they're easier to use in different parts of your software because there are no outside dependencies. If you want to write software that's easy to work on and easy to test, 
Take a look at your code and see whether you can turn some of your functions into pure functions. If you focus on putting all those side effects in a single place, they're much easier to manage. In this particular case, the greeting class prints things and it relies on the current date. If you want to write tests for this class, we would have to patch date as well as the built-in output, which is a pain. Another way to view it is that combining, for example, printing with constructing the greeting message is a single responsibility violation. They're two different things. So to make this class easier to reuse, we should remove these dependencies on things like date time, and then we should also remove the side effects like printing things to the screen. Instead of letting the greeting class create the greeting intro, we could also supply it as an argument to the initializer. So that means that this piece of code, we can move it to a separate function and then we call that function instead in another place. So what I'm going to do in this particular case is I'm going to my main function that's right here and then I'm going to paste this in here like so. And now we don't need the self here. There we go. And inside our greeting class, we're going to remove all this information right here. And the initializer is going to be really simple. So that's going to get a greeting intro like so. And let's store that in an instance variable like so. And greeting intro, that's a string. And in the main function, we simply need to pass the greeting intro as an argument like so. You can also do this differently. For example, instead of defining the greeting intro here, you could still define it in the greeting class, but supply the current date and time to greeting. So then at least when you create the instance of the class, it's going to be predictable what the result is going to be. The second thing I want to change is that greeting class is currently printing things to the screen. So we preferably want to remove that side effect. So instead of greet returning none, we could let it return a string. And then it's simply going to return the string inside the print statement. There we go. And now, of course, we also need to change greet list here. So that's going to return, let's say, a list of strings. So I'm creating a variable here, list of string, which initially is empty. I'll show you an alternative way to doing this later on as well. And then instead of calling greet like so, we're going to append the result of the greeting to the greetings list. And then in the end, we're going to return the list like so. By making these changes in the greeting class, we've turned the greeting class into something that has no side effects whatsoever because it's completely predictable what it does depending on the input that it gets. Now, of course, we move those side effects to another place, which is in the main function. So the main function clearly still has all those problems. But as you'll see often in software design is that you're going to end up with a place where you're going to do all the dirty stuff. Basically, that's where you do the printing, where you do the input name reading part that I'm doing here, where you're relying on low level or uh, let's say changing things like the date and the time etc etc now at least all that dirty stuff that we're doing is in a single place in the main function which is good because that means that everything that this code uses which in this case is only the greeting class we can now test much more easily because we can now create a unit test that creates greeting instances and then test these methods really easily without having to patch anything or uh, do anything complicated to summarize this, your functions or methods should have return values that only depend on the provided parameters, which is the case in the greeting class. For example, the greet method, it depends on self, which is the object, and that object contains the greeting intro instance variable, and the name, and it returns a string, and there is no other outside dependency. Same for greet list, it gets self, which contains the greeting intro, and the greet method that it will then turn and call and it gets the list of names that it depends on and then it returns another list of strings. Secondly, functions and methods should ideally return the same value if the parameter values are also the same. And that's also the case here. So we're not depending on the date and the time or a random number generator or something here to create different kinds of greetings. If you provide the same argument value, you're going to get exactly the same result always. And that makes function a lot easier to test. And finally, functions and methods should avoid side effects. You can't completely remove side effects because at some point you're going to probably print something to the screen or read something from a file or anything like that. But 
when you need those things, it's good to at least group them in a single place so that they're also easy to change out for something else. And that the rest of the code that you're writing is not dependent on using those side effects. Now, before I talk about the second takeaway from functional programming, I want to show you an alternative quickly of the object-oriented approach, which is using functions. So now, instead of having this class greeting, I have a greet function that gets a name and a greeting intro, and that returns this value, so it does almost exactly the same as the greeting class. And we also have a greet list that gets a list of names and the greeting intro, and that then returns a list of strings. And you see what I'm doing here also slightly differently is not using like in the object-oriented programming example where I used a variable. Here I'm using a list comprehension to call the greet function with this information for each of the names in the list. And then I have split up main a bit. I have read greeting, which determines what the greeting intro is. And I have read name, which returns the name that the user entered. And then in the main function, I'm printing the greeting and then I'm also calling greet list just for testing. So when I run this code, I get exactly the same result and I'm also printing out a list of good mornings. The second takeaway from functional programming is that functions are first class citizens. They're not just groups of statements with input arguments and a return value. They're things that you can compose, deconstruct, pass to other functions, and return as a value from a function. If a function receives a function as an argument, or it returns a function as a result, it's called a higher order function. Let's take a look at an example. In this example, we can also benefit from using higher order functions. At the moment, in the main function, we're simply passing values around. We're calling read name, which returns a result, and read greeting, which returns a result that we put into greet, which then returns a result that we provide to print. And greet list, it works in almost the same way. With higher order functions, instead of providing values to functions, you can provide functions to functions. For example, what we could do in this case is that read greeting, which uses the current date and time, and then switches between good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, we could also supply the function to the greet function instead of the intro as a string. And the advantage here is that you can choose whether or not that function should be called because that might not always be necessary and then you can increase efficiency of your code and have more control over when what piece of code is called. So I'll show you an example. Let's say I define a type called greeting reader, which is a callable. And that doesn't take any arguments, but it's going to return a string to us. And as you can see, read greeting is an example of a greeting reader function. It doesn't get any arguments and it returns a string. So then instead of providing the greeting intro here, we can provide a greeting reader. And that's of type greeting reader. And here then, of course, I also have to change this because this is going to be the greeting reader and I have to call that function now inside greet. And the same thing for greet list. So I provide a greeting reader here. And let's also specify the type. And I do the same thing here. There we go. And as you can see, I'm passing along the greeting reader function to the greet function, which now also expects a greeting reader. And now the only thing I need to change in my main function is that I shouldn't call the function, but I should provide the function as an argument. There we go. If I run this code, it's going to do exactly the same. All right, Ariane, except now it's afternoon. It's like just one past 12, but it does apart from that exactly the same thing. And the fun thing is because we're now passing a function, we have control over whether that function should be called or not inside the greet function. So for example, I could change greet function to check that if the name is Arian, then we're just going to return bugger off. And in this case, I don't need to call this function. I can just say bugger off because that's the default response apparently when the name is Arian. So when I run this, let's try that again. I enter my name, Arian. Oh, I should use the right spelling, then you see I get bugger off. Another concept from functional programming is partial function application. And that means that you create a new function that's based on an original function, but with some of the arguments already applied. And we can also use that here. For example, if I go back to my main function, I could use partial to create a greeting function that already has the greeting reader function applied to it. So let's import partial 
that's from func tools. And then in my main function, I'm going to create a greet function, which is a partial application of greet. And I'm going to supply it the greeting reader, which is read greeting. And now when I call this function here, so instead of greet, I'm calling the function, I don't need to provide read greeting anymore. So this is an example of partial function application. So you get an object with partially applied arguments that is then a function you can call in different places. And you can even take this a step further. For example, greet list currently gets a greeting reader and then calls greet with the greeting reader. So what we can also do is define a greeting function, which is a callable that gets a string and that also returns a string. So this is simply a function that takes a name and then returns the greeting. And then we have the greeting function here. So I'm gonna change, I'm going to update the type greeting function. And now it's going to call the greeting function here with just the name. So this simply calls the function for each of the names in the list. And now in my main function, instead of providing read greeting here, I provide the read function like so. Let's run this code. And we get exactly the same result as before, except now we're relying on partial function application to call these other functions here. So I hope this shows you that functions are really flexible and that you can do a lot of things with them. Now, it doesn't mean you have to go all in on using higher order functions and partial function application everywhere, because if you overdo it, it might also lead to less readable code. But don't forget that these tools exist and that you can use them to design and organize your code a bit differently than you're maybe used to. In imperative languages like Python, variables can be accessed or changed anytime you like. In declarative languages, variables are generally bound to expressions and keep a single value during their entire lifetime. For example, in Excel, you specify what needs to be computed in each cell. One cell doesn't change the expression of another cell that would become a huge mess. Similarly, in functional languages like Haskell, there are variables, but by default, they're not mutable. Once the value is set, that's it. Though Haskell does support mutable variables. What's the advantage of having immutable variables? Well, for one, it solves many multi-threading problems where we might have multiple threads trying to change a single shared variable at the same time. Another benefit is that if we have a guarantee that a variable never changes, our programs become a lot easier to understand and they're also much easier to test. Let's look at a few examples. I have a very simple example here. It's only a main function, creates a list and then performs some operations on the list. So the first thing that I wanna look at is sorting. So you can do sorting in an mutable way or in an immutable way. Here you see an example of a mutable sort. So I take my test list, which contains a bunch of numbers and I'm calling sort on that test list. And this is mutable because sort changes the test list itself. So when I print the list, I'm going to get the modified list. Immutable sort is different, and that's using the sorted function, which is also built into Python, and that gets a test list and then creates another list, the sorted list. And this is a copy that's sorted, but it doesn't change the original list. So now I can print the original list here, and it will still show me this, and I can print the sorted list, which is going to show me the sorted version of this. Let me run this to show you what I mean. So here you see what we get. So the first part is using an immutable sort. So we get a new sorted list, which is this one, but we still have the original list. But after applying the mutable sort, the original list is now changed. Here you see also a disadvantage of using mutable operations like in place sorting that we have here, which is that if you wanna retain the original list and you want to print both of them, you can't because you lost the original data. So you can't verify anymore whether the sorting happens according to what you want it. If we don't change the original list, like what we're doing here with the immutable sort, then it doesn't matter. We still have the original and we have the sorted list, so we have both. And then printing both, or if you still need to work with the original list for some reason, you still have it, so that makes it a bit easier. Setting up testing is also easier when you're using immutable operations. For example, in this case, if you want to set up a property test to verify that the length 
of the original and the sorted list is the same, this is very easy here because we have both of the values after we perform the operation. If you use multiple sort, you would need to make sure to make a copy beforehand and then you can still do the comparison, of course, but it's a bit of extra work, an extra thing you need to think about when you're setting up your test. And this happens everywhere in the code where you're relying on mutables because you may not have the original data, so you have to make sure that you don't lose that. Another nice thing about sorted is that it actually accepts an iterable. So that's what you see here on the screen. So that means sorted actually works on other things than lists. So if I replace, let's say this test list by a tuple. So now we're going to have this, something like this. Now the immutable sort still works. But tuple doesn't have a sort function, so I can't do this anymore. So immutable sorting in that sense also gives you a bit of extra flexibility, since in order to sort something, we only need an iterable. We, it, we don't care whether that's a list or a tuple or something else. I just want to quickly show you another example of mutable and immutable operations. So it's not just for sorting, but it works for other things as well. So here I have a list of cards, and suppose I want to shuffle this deck of cards. Now, there's also here an immutable and a mutable way to do it. So in this case, here is the mutable version of this. So that does a random dot shuffle and then prints out the card. So this changes the cards variable. But if I use random dot sample, I provided the cards and I tell it to sample all the cards from the deck, then I get a new shuffled card list and the original cards list is not changed. And also here, when I run this, so you see we have our shuffle card, I still have the original card, but here after I do the mutable shuffle, I don't have the original list anymore. And also here random.sample is more flexible because it expects simply a sequence, whereas shuffle expects a mutable sequence. So if I change this again to a tuple, like so, you see that random.sample can handle this perfectly fine, but random.shuffle can't. So immutability potentially gives you extra flexibility. And it's not just for these simple structures like lists or tuples. You can also use it, for example, in data classes. So data class has a frozen option that's also really nice to make sure that your data doesn't change. And then it also makes it a lot easier to write tests for that. So what's the takeaway of this? Well, if you notice in your code that you're changing variables all the time, try to restructure it so that it happens less often. Can you turn some of those things into immutable structures instead? And when you do that, you're going to notice that your code is going to be much easier to maintain because things are going to be more separated and it's also going to be probably easier to read as well. If you keep these three takeaways in mind while you're writing your code, you're going to almost automatically navigate towards taking better design decisions. If you want to learn even more about applying ideas from functional programming to your code, you can do some pretty cool stuff with Python's Fung2 package. Check out this video next. Thanks for watching, take care, and see you soon.